Good afternoon, everybody. Hi. Thanks for that. Uh, thank you all for being here this afternoon, this beautiful, beautiful afternoon. We're here, um, as you know, to commemorate the exhibit While You Sleep, a survey of Shizu Salamando, which is currently on view through December 7th at the Vincent Price Art Museum at ULAC, East Los Angeles College. And I think, is it true that we have a catalog of the exhibit yes. on sale here this yes. afternoon? Yes. And is that the box. where it's, it's over there? Uh, <laughs> discounted rate for students, so please feel free to peruse that at some point this afternoon. Shizu uh, Salamando is a Los Angeles based artist who has exhibited her drawing, her painting, and her sculpture, and video work. Was this adjusted for you? Yeah. Sorry. No, no, you can <laughs> adjust it. it. I, ne I never have this experience of being taller than somebody. <laughs> um, she has exhibited her work um, both locally and internationally, and we are very delighted to welcome this former Bruin She's received her BA from UCLA School of Arts and Architecture. And minor in Chicano Studies. And she minored in Chicano <laughs> Studies, all right! <laughs> um, and her master's degree in art from CalArts. I am not a visual artist. My name is Marissa Lopez, and I'm a professor of Chicano Studies and English here at UCLA. I'm also the associate director of the center, the Chicano Studies Research Center. As I just said, I'm, I'm a professor of English, and so I want to begin talking about Shizu's work by way of analogy to the work of a great literary artist, the American short story master Henry James. In a story called The Real Thing, which James wrote in 1892, a nameless narrator, who's an artist who creates illustrations for popular magazines, he tries to understand why he's having such a hard time painting a couple, his name is The Monarchs, they are genuine or European aristocrats. They are the real thing, as opposed to the fake ones that the artist makes a living drawing. I liked them, James writes. I had no objection to them, but somehow, with all their perfections, I didn't easily believe in them. Combined with this was my innate preference for the represented subject over the real one. The defect of the real one was so apt to be a lack of representation. I liked things that appeared. Then one was sure. Whether they were or not was a subordinate and almost always profitless question. So the narrator in the story can't paint the monarchs because he can't make them be anything besides what they already are. I was reminded of the story, I was reminded of James when reading an interview that Giant Robot did with Shizu a few years ago. And Shizu was telling a story about painting her friend Martha, who had modeled for Paris Vogue. And Shizu found the experience frustrating and vowed never to paint Martha again because, I did. as she <laughs> explained, well, she broke her vow. But in the article, she said she was never going to do it again because, as she says to her friend, quote, you're too attractive and there's nothing I can do. So there's nothing she can do. So in this instance, Shizu runs up against the same problem as James's nameless narrator in The Real Thing. What is it that these artists do that both of them can't do in this instance with perfect people? So Shizu's work has been celebrated for its reflections of contemporary youth subcultures in Los Angeles. There are hybrid styles and ethnicities which she renders in meticulous, stunning drawings, paintings, and collages, which we'll get to see some of this afternoon. Shizu paints portraits from photographs of her friends in these unguarded, candid poses in relatively private spaces. But she doesn't just reflect these images back to us, the viewer. She meditates upon, she mediates, and she transforms them into something new through reversals like the one that we see in Looking at Art, The Reception, which was her MFA thesis exhibition. This featured large-scale pen drawings of groups of her friends gathered at an art opening, except instead of inviting the viewer's gaze into the subjects, the painting, the drawings kind of turn the tables, right? This, they show the subjects peering out at the viewers, making us consider our own assumptions about the art object, and ourselves in relation to others. Less explicitly, Shizu's work challenges and reverses expectations through her chosen media. She paints and draws often on untreated canvas, plywood, bed sheets, or butcher paper. 
and the background is often um, more important or as important than the foreground, as the foreground in one of her portraits. She uses decorative, glittery, and origami paper. And this both empowers and disempowers context, signaling the mix of high and low that we see often in her work and also coyly and subtly referencing Asian influences on her work. She uses media, especially with her 2005 handkerchief series, The Holy Quattro, which is one of my personal favorites. I don't know that we get to talk about it this afternoon. It features um, drawings of Morrissey and Susie Sue and other um, Brit pop stars of the shoegazing variety. So her use of media, especially in this work, has been widely referenced. So, and hopefully we'll be able to touch on that in our discussion this afternoon. And with that, I'm going to turn things over to the artist herself. So please join me in welcoming Shizu to UCLA's Chicano Studies Research Center. Wow, thank you so That was such an amazing detailed intro. I'm very honored for that. Like I wasn't expecting like a whole thesis on my work. Thank you. Um, so uh, I'm gonna start, oh, first of all, thanks for coming and um, showing up, I really appreciate it. Like, it's really nice of you guys to come out on this hot afternoon. Um, I am gonna start uh, this lecture with a piece I had done actually as a student at UCLA uh, here when I was an art student. Um, I was taking a, Alan, a class with Alan Rupersberg, who is a, um, I guess, conceptual uh, video installation artist. Uh, he was a guest professor at UCLA's art department, and he gave out these um, VHS cassettes, random ones that he found at a garage sale, and one of them happened to be a uh, Japanese soap opera. And my grandmother, who lives in this hotel area of LA, she always would watch soap operas, or Japanese soap operas, and I would go and visit her, and we'd just sit there and watch Japanese TV all day. So I thought it would be a great idea for her to translate, so the project that I would do for the, the class would be have her translate the soap opera for me, and I'd record it, um, and, and I created this installation. So she's like talking about what's going on in the soap opera and I just re recorded her um, explaining what was going on and it was actually for four hours long that the actual piece was because that's how long the VHS cassette was. And, um, and then we installed it in the class and uh, it was a, yeah, it was a really, it was sort of like the first um, video project I had done uh, and it was very sort of personal sort of um, precursor to a lot of the work that I ended up doing um, now too and, and that is like a, a video portrait of something very familiar to me, a family member and and what how I see her and I wanted to share this experience of her translating the soap opera to me and not kind of understanding exactly what she was saying too, like her translation wasn't that clear but you kind of get the gist of it and I didn't want to disturb her sometimes because I think she was getting into it and so it was, it was a um, yeah, it was one of the first video pieces I had done. Um, this is a piece that I piggyback off that one because it's sort of commemorating this community of uh, Japanese Americans who survived in internment camps. And my uncle who passed away uh, that year, I wanted to do a, a, uh, um, a commemorative piece for him because uh, I was invited as, as Chicana City's people, you know about the Day of the Dead, and every time there's a Day of the Dead, everybody's there's this big call for altars, and that's a great way to start showing your work. If you guys ever want to start showing artwork, is go and show at a Day of the Dead show because it's pretty like open. and And I was asked to do an altar, so I thought I'd do an altar for my uh, Japanese uncle Aki, who had passed away, and he was a survivor of the camps. Um, he really liked to fish, um, and I did this piece for him because. During Janet, when I went to a talk at Janum, um, one of the docents, all, they're all survivors of the camps too, the internment camps, and uh, they, he was talking about how when someone passed away, they would make paper flower wreaths or paper flower bouquets for people who passed away because there wasn't any real flowers located on the camps. So they had to make their own. So they would all get together in a sort of communal crafting day and make paper flowers. So for Aki, I thought I'd do the same thing because they're sort of really beautiful, these, um, paper flowers, but then I used um, really fancy Japanese washi paper instead of the normal like crepe paper that they would use that they ordered from uh, the Sears Robux catalog. And that's how they got all their supplies, their art supplies at the camps was through the Sears Robux catalog. So that's where that piece came out of. And also I did these drawings of these wire remnants that they found on the caskets that used to be, you know, on um, paper flower bouquets. 
So this is a piece that I did, I think, right after UCLA. Um, I was asked to be a part of a peachy folder show, <laughs> and I was given a peachy folder to decorate. And peachy folders, I don't know if you guys are too young for that, but mm -hmm. it's like an old, uh, kind of like a me traffic keeper folder thing. I don't know what you guys have now. But um, I, you take all these different, there's all these different like sports figures, all these jocks, like there's a cheerleader, a tennis player, um, what is that, basketball, baseball, track stars, football players. And, you, and everybody kind of like doodled over them when you're little to make them into different characters that were more relatable than I guess just jocks. So for me, I did all these like different sort of subcultures of LA. I did like the goth girl with the goth lunchbox and the day laborers and punk rock kids and Morrissey fans and the girl on a scooter. So that was that piece um, for the Peachy Folder show. Um, I also did these after UCLA too. These are, I think I did these actually after grad school. I'm not sure, but I started, do, I started getting really rebellious against the like uber conceptualness of CalArts and I just wanted to revert back to what I was really, um, what inspired me to do artwork in the first place. So I started drawing ballpoint pen drawings on notebook paper. It is kind of like sort of regressive, but I'm, order, I'm ordering these in a very like, I guess like um, visual aesthetic so you can see like it makes sense visually but time-wise these are all around and there's no really rhyme or reason to why I did certain projects before or after. Um, these are, yeah, and these are my friends. This is my friend Sadie and her girlfriend Lauren and they're like the hippest couple in the world. Um, Sadie's from Oakland so I did this drawing of them. Um, this is my friend Rocky. Uh, this is, this project was ballpoint pen on handkerchief as well, not notebook paper. Um, at CalArts, I started this project again because I think I did one self-portrait of this version. I don't know where it is now, but I did a self-portrait at UCLA when I went with, with Patty Whitman's class, a drawing class, and it was just on handkerchief. And the reason I did this was because I remember when I was growing up in San Francisco in the Mission District. It was during the 90s, and there was a lot of gang violence, and there was a lot of, like, cholo art around, like, um, my friends would buy, like, we had, um, my friend Vida had a, we'd go and we'd get, like, Teen Angel magazines and try to copy the drawings. It was weird, too, because Molly knows Vida and Molly, but we're always very, like, artsy. Like, we'd always be drawing paper dolls or whatever. And so then when, like, teen, we'd look at these Teen Angel magazines, because Vida was a crazy chola, and we'd try to, like, write fake letters to people, like the prisoners. And I'm only saying this because Molly's here, so she can nod, and I don't feel so weird to talking about it. But, um, yeah, we would, like, write letters, like, fake book like fake early letters and just crack ourselves up doing it. We never sent them, but, and also try to copy the drawings in the, in the magazine Teen Angel, which I'm gonna be in Teen Angel actually, the oh next God. issue coming out. <laughs> and I can, I was really happy about that because then I got a review in artform.com, so artform and Teen Angel, and once I was like, oh my gosh, this is perfect. So, um, <laughs> so anyways, like, so I did this portrait of my friends on, on handkerchiefs because I felt like, it was more true to who I was because I didn't feel any connection to like the uber like crazy gangster cholo with the big mustache and who with the Loretta car and the naked girl or the Aztec god or whoever that was on it and I was like well that's not really my reality now like these are my friends these are who I hang out with um, this is who I want to portray because I don't really see them around in in imagery and I see a lot of art with like you know the um, and the fact like I'm from the Mission District. So like murals were everywhere and it's always a sort of like hearkening to like, you know, your indigenous roots. And I was like, okay, like that's really cool that that's there, but what can I bring to that? What can I bring to that dialogue? So I thought to do my friends. So um, these are more shots of my friends. Um, Ex-boyfriend. <laughs> this is the Holy Cuatro that you were talking about with so when I went to LA, it was different because in the Bay Area, it's kind of a little bit more like, I guess, urban. So a lot of the music that everybody was listening to in my neighborhood, it was a lot more hip hop. Um, Baiko was more, I guess, more urban. I don't know how to classify this, but when I went to LA, there was like all these kids into Morrissey and Susie and The Cure and Depeche Mode. And I was like, this is the stuff that I was listening to in high school too, but all my friends that would listen to it with me were other like punk rock Asian girls. So it was weird that there were like Latinos down here that were like super into it. So I felt like, what? This is weird. Like I'm not used to this. So like I go to all these clubs, 
Um, and yeah, and it would be predominantly like Mexicans, Chicanos that were there. And I thought like, that's really cool. Like that there's such a huge population of Chicanos down in LA that there wasn't like this weird minority complex that I think in the Bay Area, there maybe exists a little bit more. Um, and it was like, you can be whatever kind of like, you don't have to be just look like, you don't have to just look like a chola or be like super down for the brown, like, and wear it on your sleeve. You can just like dye your hair pink and it's okay. This is how it was when I was in like the 90s, so in the Mission District, which is a lot different now. But um, these are some of the things that, that I was like noticing the difference of, and maybe that's why um, I chose to depict who I did. And a lot of it is because I felt I was I was like an outsider. I was from San Francisco, so when I moved down here, I could see it from like this outsider perspective and kind of like see see the difference and paint and therefore paint it. Um, and I think that's something that a lot of people probably took for granted because they grew up with it or that was that was here. So um, so I go to like house parties with my friends. Um, my friend Brenda Zuniga, who is from Whittier, I was her roommate at the California State Summer School for the Arts in, um, I think it was at CalArts. So when I was in high school, I went to that. And we decided to be roommates when we were at um, UCLA's art school. So I would go home with her a lot. And that was sort of my the beginning of going to these parties and partying with all these people and starting to do portraits of that scene that I was like, becoming a part of. So that's, um, this is my friend Elvia and Cindy. This is called, I think, Elvia's Plea. This is on a bed sheet. Um, I started drawing on bed sheets too because bed sheets were sort of like this more, it was a, a larger canvas to work with than a handkerchief. Um, but also it was, it was just more referencing of the subject matter in terms of this really like dramatic moment that happened at a club. Um, so that, therefore the bed sheet made a lot of sense. Um, <clears throat> but Elvia is actually a student. She was a UCLA alum as well, and so is Cindy. I think I'm not sure what Cindy majored in now, too. But they were here too, and I met them here. Um, this is my friend Arnold Vargas. This is uh, looking from the Looking at Art reception series. Um, this piece was done at Cal Arts, and it was I was getting a lot of these um, critiques of my work as being very problematic because uh, Cal Arts, my class in the art school at that time, was like not diverse at all. I think there was a couple Asian students. Um, I think there was like one and a half uh, Latino people or, or Mexican people. And that was one guy was from Mexico. Like he was totally like fresa, he had like a benefactor and stuff. And then it was like me. So it was like one and a half. And um, that was my class. And uh, so I was getting these like reads about how um, my work was creating this like really problematic dynamic or binary between a white viewer gallery goer and like this Chicano Latino or minority subject on the wall and it was like really okay so I had been working at self-help graphics I'm from the mission district I would I would go to Galleria in San Francisco all the time like that's what I grew up with and then I was getting this read and I was like what planet are you on have you not gone to like certain sh I mean I understand that because where I was from, like everybody that went to galleries and participated in normal life where Mexicans do. Like it didn't make any sense to me. Um, so I started doing these pictures or these drawings on canvas instead of handkerchief to commemorate like, okay, well to connote more of like a higher painting reference, like they're on paint, they're on canvas now. Um, and also, so I just take pictures of all these um, friends, all my friends, I was like, look, that were artists themselves. And I was like, look at me, like you're looking at an art piece. And so I would go to these shows. I think this one was from Slanguage in Wilmington. So I was in Slanguage at Wilmington, and I asked my friend Arnold to look at me like you're looking at art. Um, I asked my friend Sony. I think she, I think it was at uh, CalArts, actually. We're at some the opening receptions, hence the red cup, <laughs> which makes appearances in my work a lot. But I was like, Sony, look at me like you're looking at art. And so she did, too. And these are all like larger than life size. These are two by four feet, um, hence that, that series. Um, and then I got like really tired of doing sort of these institutional critiques. And I was like, art about art is so boring, and I just didn't want to do it anymore. So I'm glad I'm out of Kellers. <laughs> this is another one. This is um, Art Dudo looking at art. I think this one was taken at Bergamot Station. Um, <coughs> and this was uh, one of the first pieces I did at Kellers. It's uh, my friend Elvia and Cindy again. And we're at a barbecue in Pico Rivera. And I think it's um, Fourth of July. And I think that's why they're friends. I think her name was Juana. I'm not sure that girl. I think her name was Juana. She was wearing her zapata 
shirt in honor of Fourth of July. She said, "So that's <laughs> she's in." Mm -hmm. Was this one of the first pieces then when you started working with collage or? Um, no, no. This was that. Uh, this was one of the first pieces I did Cal Arts, but I had done another series with collage before this. Um, I did them like actually after UCLA I started working with collage, like in between UCLA and, and Cal Arts. There was like a three year, three okay. about three years of period where I just did painting and collage, and then at Cal Arts I started doing colored pencil and collage. So I'm not sure if that's yeah. Uh, this was another that one of the last pieces I did. This was for the MFA, not the thesis show, the grid, the big group show that they have, Supersonic or something. So yeah, that was this piece I did. I went, I was like, screw the whole institutional critique. I'm not gonna do. I'm just gonna do what I want to do. So I did a portrait of my friend Carm and her sister and Zara at some. This was I think Huntington Park. It was a barbecue in Huntington Park. And again, the, the collage. And the collage sort of functions for me as another reference or another sort of like um, analogy for the way like people kind of construct themselves too because it's like you kind of like put all these like you'd have a tattoo or taking from one of these like subcultures or references or musical references or scenes and creating your look in the same way collage sort of I think is like a mimic or like a, a part of that. Um, this was a piece I did called Highland Park Blue Owl and um, my friend Richard was dating this girl from Highland Park, and her birthday was in was in at her house in the backyard. So she put these streamers up and called it a luau, but no one I think took it too seriously because no one was dressed <laughs> like it was a luau. So I guess the streamers were the luau part. But there it was like a tiered backyard. So when I was on the we were on the bottom, all the older people because he was kind of robbing the cradle because she was really young. <laughs> so we were there on the bottom of the thing, and I just see a picture of the of the party going on, and and he was a. Um, Actually, Richard went to UCLA too. He was a lifeguard at the, I think it says Alatoria Pool. That's where he got the, the chairs from for the party. <laughs> this is a portrait of Carm, my friend Carm, the girls from the Huntington Park barbecue. These are the parents. This is at um, Angie's, Angie's brother's girlfriend's house, I think. And it was her birthday party they had in the backyard. And she wanted, it was in October, so she wanted like a, Halloween slash Mexican theme. So that's why she had the the um the Guadalupe flag and the sign up. And um yeah, her dad is from I think he's from Rosarito or somewhere like that. But um it was sort of more tongue in cheek because they they threw up in Downey and people are like, Well this is a very like Chicano um piece because of this flag and and I was like, well, actually, it wasn't like De La, like De La Hoya was fighting or anything. It was really just because she wanted a Mexican themed party to go with the the, de, the um, Halloween theme. So that's where. And this is a portrait of her parents. And her mom just um, passed away from a heart attack a couple of years ago. So it was really hard for me to talk about this piece at the the museum because um, their dad was there at the talk, and so I kind of lost it. I was like, oh man, I'm going to talk about this in front of him. So. This is a portrait of my friend Cindy again and Ozma in the bathroom. I think this was at some club in Chinatown, not Grand Star, a different one. The one on the, I think it's like Roberto's or something. And um, there's some like goth night, I guess. So again, there's like the collage, but it's very like subtle. Like I guess the more, the more I used it, the more like less and less um, parts of it I would, I would put on. But yeah, like these are just sort of all, portraits of friends that I hang out with and they're all kind of like homage pieces to me like I kind of wanted to just be very respectful of the people I was depicting and um, and it was just kind of born out of this like extreme like admiration or or love you know and that's that's why I wanted to depict a, a lot of that's why I depict my friends and I got this, these questions from the LAE setter and they were like oh like do you feel awkward going up to people and asking them to pose, do you ever get rejected? Like they don't want to pose for you, and how? What kind of camera do you use? Does the camera intimidate people when you're when you're drawing them? And I was like, well, I'm not a like a scene pho like photog. Like I'm not like at a club just snapping pictures of people. Like I actually <laughs> wouldn't. I don't feel comfortable doing that. Like I don't like drawing strangers. And if I do, it's like, always a very awkward moment, intense moment, asking people, can I 
can I take your picture? Um, I usually am only moved to do that if I have like a deadline or something and I'm like, oh, really desperate. Like, okay, I need to take pictures at the Grand Star because the um, Chinese American Museum wants to do work about Chinatown. So I gotta go. So I went to Chinatown, I went to this club and took pictures of people at the Grand Star. And that was like the last time I think I've done that. And otherwise I wouldn't um, really feel comfortable doing that. And I go, these are like actual people. Um, recently too, a friend told me that he found this like club flyer or no, like this band is promoting their show coming up and they used Martha's image from the cover of the book. And uh, I was like, you know, like this is a real person. It's not, it's not like some random skull or rose I drew. Like it's a real person and she exists and I don't know how she'd feel to see her image like promoting some band that she's never heard of. Like, you know, so I told, I had to tell her like, hey Martha, some Yushi band like stole your image for their flyer. And she's like, oh, she's kind of like okay with it. Surprisingly, like, oh, okay, that's cool, you know. But I was like, yeah, it's not cool. So um, it's just a distinction that I have to make a lot. Is like these aren't like strangers. And I'm just like, ooh, like look at this guy and his hair. It's more like, yeah, that's Gerardo. Like he's a totally cool, awesome guy and crazy. And that's why I wanted to to paint him. So this is my friend Carm's ex girlfriend, and so she hates this piece. This is Sandy. <laughs> Um, this is a drawing I did at, there's a club in Azusa and Maria Daniela was playing there and she's like this really minimal uh, electronic like conceptual art like musician from Mexico and there's like tons of people there for her to see her and I thought wow that's crazy that so many people know about her up here and are down for her stuff so I just took a picture a snapshot of the crowd and, and drew it and again like that's what interests me more is like the actual crowd or the scene or the people that are actually into something and, and creating their world um, outside of like some sort of like K-Rock like sanctioned um, corporate rock or something. It's like, wow, this like independent musician is performing. And I don't, you know, I'm not really into celebrity that much. I'm more interested in the fans. Um, so therefore, I just cut her off. Her music's not that great anyways. But, yeah. um, this is my friend Candice. Um, Candace is one of the few people that asked me not to draw her anymore. <laughs> she was like, uh, can you just not like draw me anymore? Because this piece was actually, um, there was a party that my friend, uh, actually not my friend, there was a party that one of the, so this collector bought this piece, took it to his house, had it unframed on sitting on the kitchen table, and some lady like ripped it up. She was so like angry because I guess like the story was her ex-boyfriend had left her for an Asian lady. So she ripped up this drawing because she was so like mad about Asian people stealing her men. So yeah, it was just like really ridiculous. And the story got back to Candace and I said, Candace, I'm really sorry about your portrait. So I think that kind of like affected her and she was like, yeah, I don't draw me anymore. So I was like, okay, so I never drew her anymore, but she's still a great, great muse, I guess. Um, this is a car that was parked in front of my apartment building for for years, and then one day I just decided I always wanted to draw it because I thought it was the best, like the most amazing art car ever. And uh, in the same way that the portraits and the collages work, it's like this guy like took so much care into bedazzling his car, and every time I come out, there'd be more crap like glued to it, or you know, like the the Calvin and Hobbes praying to Jesus. He like he likes Nike. Um, he's very religious. He, you know, he listens to Super Estrella. I had to like, I, it was too hard to cut. I couldn't make the decals say Super, super Estrella, so I cut that part out. It's just too complicated. But I did keep the Pumas, like, license plate holder in honor. I didn't want, I didn't want to keep that part for him. Um, but yeah, and he, you know, he painted his own car and these like weird stripes on it, like racing stripes. And I think he has a Honda now because I noticed the Honda in the neighborhood started to get more and more Puma stuff on it. So I think he traded this one in for a Honda Accord. So I'm waiting for it to get like really bedazzled before I take a picture of that one. But there's going to be a second part to this series, hopefully. Um, this is a portrait of my ex-boyfriend's um, nephew who graduated from the Marine Academy a couple years ago. This one's called uh, Francisco's Graduation. And it's sort of this weird, bittersweet moment because, um, yeah, there's not a lot of opportunities out there for people anymore, especially like low income or brown people, so I took this photo of him standing with his friends. Um, so let's see. This one was done at, this is a portrait of these three girls 
at this show that happened at Self Help Graphics a long time ago. This is called uh, Waiting, and this was actually was taken because I was commissioned by Bart to do a poster, and it was called like Chica Chic, and it was up at the Center for Integral Studies in San Francisco, and they commissioned artists to do these huge bus posters that were going to be on Bart, the Bart trains and the Bart stations. So I wanted to do a portrait of like young kids that young punk rock girls are hanging out. Um, and so I did this one, and I thought it'd be a good image to show um, in the Bay Area. This is that my friend was having um, like a record swap backyard hardcore show. So it's called Backyard Hardcore. This guy was like puking his guts out on the tree, and he was like totally passed out, and his friends were laughing at him. And there's just something really romantic <laughs> and like beautiful in his like slumber, like passed out slumber. And yeah, I guess so. I just took a picture of him like laying there. And this is a piece that was done for the, yeah, this was done for the Chinese American show that we do, or just that we deconstructing Chinatown. So this is when I had to go to the Morris United and take pictures of strangers at the Grand Star. So I asked them, I was like, hey, can I take a picture of you? And she was cool. She was like, yeah. And I was like, can you put your arm around him <laughs> so we can see your tattoo? She's like, sure. So yeah, people are pretty, like, if, if people are pretty really open to that. But. Yeah, um, and then I had to break down and do a self-portrait because I was running out of images. <laughs> the image on the end is a, another Grand Star one, too. But yeah, I hate drawing strangers. This is Ripples in Long Beach. That was for my friend Rigo's, I don't know why we were there. Is this birthday party or something? I don't know. It was like, it's like a drag queen bar in Long Beach. I think there's a performance, and then this is like after. This is the self-portrait. <laughs> I had to ask somebody to pose with me. <laughs> So you guys know. <laughs> this is Raquel. Um, she's a good friend. I was asked. I was on the show at uh, the what is it called? The Steve Turner Gallery, and I was kind of apprehensive about the show because it was. I guess it was like a more of a like a, I don't know. It's not. It's not exactly a blue chip gallery, but it was like um, on Wilshire, and so I just decided to do portraits of my artist friends or other artists and creative people. Um, and this was one of Raquel, and I got this really crazy review of that show. Like it was really scary because this woman wrote about how my work was. Or the, she didn't really review the work. She reviewed the exhibition reception and how my work catered to like this like Latino art glitterati or something, and that like the people at the exhibition canoodled and drank beautifully for us. And I was like, who's us? And, um, <laughs> and then how like I was armed to take over the art world with a oh, wife beater and opium perfume. And I was like, who would write that? That sounds awful. Like it was supposed to be like a positive review, but it was so problematic. And I was just like, this is horrible. Like, and I was really freaked out. And I was like, is that what I'm going to be? Like the, the poster child of like, oh, I'm Asian and Latino, like oh, I'm Mexican Japanese, like woohoo, I'm so exotic. Like, so I wear like a geisha with a sombrero or something when I go to shows, like what do you, and I'm like, cause if you look at the work, it's just like, I mean, how can you really like be between these two? Like, I didn't understand it at all. And I was like, oh, I was just like grossed out by that whole thing. So um, yeah, and I was like, do I really want to like participate in this like crazy, this really is like CalArts kind of views all over again, of like super institutional, like hierarchical. Um, it was just like, it was just like really awful. Like I had a lot of qualms with academia in general. I think it's like super repressive and hierarchical and just so problematic in its whole structure. Sorry, guys. But yeah, like it's just not, it's, I don't, I mean, yeah. So I was getting really frustrated with, with that. And then um, just, yeah, a lot of, a lot of things and I, didn't know like do I want does do I want my work to exist in this context if this is the read that I'm gonna get. Um, so yeah, um, this is another piece I did for I got asked to be in another like okay, so I did the Phantom Sighting show, the Chicano show, and then I got asked to be part of the Asian portraiture show at the Smithsonian. And um, I did a series of portraits of friends again, because um, that's what I do. But uh, this is a portrait of my friend May, is from San Francisco. She's from the same area that I am. And uh, she was living down here. She had just gone through a divorce. So I did a portrait of her. Um, and I was 
they're trying to like think like what kind of portraits they'd have at the Smithsonian. And I was like, I gotta do a portrait of me. So I actually called her and asked if she'd pose for me. So that's where this one. Um, this is actually from the Steve Turner show. This was Rigo Maldonado, um, portrait of him. This is a piece that was in the, the Portraiture Now show at the, the Smithsonian. This is Carmen, her girlfriend. Um, this is a portrait of Daniel Hernandez, who's a writer. Um, I think he's like the editor of Vice Mexico right now. He's like, yeah, he's like crazy, gone up. Like I remember when he was like a little, I guess like writer, staff writer at the LA Weekly, and now, or, now he's the editor of Vice Mexico. So um, that's him and his boyfriend in their apartment. Mexico City. Um, this is a portrait of Carmen, Angie, and Rocky. So you see, there's like, they're like my friends and make recurring appearances in my work. Um, this is a portrait of Gerardo Reyes. He's a fashion designer. I don't know if you guys know him, but he does really, he did like Jenny Rivera stuff for a while, and then um, before she passed away, um, he's worked for Skin Graphs. I don't know what he's doing now, but he, yeah, I think he's on his way to do like another show soon. But um, I think he's from Compton, I'm not sure. But he's always like looking like super hard in all his photos that like I've seen of him. And then we're at um, my friend Albert's Halloween party and he came up like in drag kind of because he's wearing like a gold jacket that was really cool. And I was, so I shot him. He was actually posed with my boyfriend at the time, but I cut that guy out. And I just like hit <laughs> him, that's why he like leaned. Um, this is for the Asian show. This is Neil Jean. He's another artist. He's a video artist. Um, this is Raquel and Karen Thompson. Karen really likes karaoke. Like she's crazy about it. Like she goes like every day she can to the smog cutter. Um, so I was catching them in this moment as she was getting down. I forgot what song it was. But this is this is another piece I did for the Smithsonian show. I was like, what can I do? Like, I don't want to be an artist assistant. It's obvious that I don't like, like, I'm just like really tired of like trying to break into like this art world thing. And I was like, well, I want to try a tattoo. Um, my friend, her, her, whose mom just passed away, um, she wanted someone to do a portrait of her mom for her, for like a memorial piece. And I was like, that sounds really beautiful. And I wish I knew how to tattoo so I could do it for you. And um, so I was like, maybe I should just try to do it because I was sick of working for this other artist and. She was miserable. Um, I think Mike Kelly committed suicide. Um, Ron Lopez committed suicide. Like, everybody's like dropping like flies. Like it's like the art world's like very hard to navigate in. Like everybody's like miserable. Like it's such a I don't know. Anyway, so I'm going off on this tangent, and it's being recorded too. This is horrible. But anyways, so it's like I just have to like release all of this and and and. Find again what makes me happy. What do I really like about art? Like, what do I really want to do? So, um, I asked around and I got this uh, apprenticeship at the shop in East LA. They're looking for a girl to work there because there are a bunch of like scary looking shoulder guys that work there and they need a girl. And I was like, yeah, sure. So, I started working there and I really, really liked it. Like, it was something that I wish I'd done a long time ago. Um, yeah, there's just like this weird sort of connection to the person you have it's like a collaborative experience like you're working with a client you're working with somebody that's just very appreciative of you um, working with them and creating art with them like it's not this this weird inside the studio insular thing where you're alone but it's like an actual interactive or exchanging ideas with the person placement color like where they want on their body and usually it's a very like traumatic event or something that they want to um, commemorate so in a way it's like it's very spiritual as well and i was really liking it and really enjoying it. And the guys I work with are hilarious too, so that helps. But um, yeah, so that's where, wow, and this one works. Like I've done this talk other times and these pictures don't work for some reason. But, so this is, I've done a lot of like copies of, so this one was a Munch tattoo. Um, so yeah, um, on my friend Martha, Martha the pretty girl <laughs> on her arm. And actually did draw, uh, paint her in this, the Vincent Price one too, <clears throat> but she's a lot older now, so she looks more real, I think. Um, this was a portrait of Alice Bag. Um, my friend Marcus wanted. So these are all like practice tattoos that I did on people when I was first starting. Um, and this is like the birth of Susie Chola, Chola Susie that my friend Ariel wanted that she never got done that I ended up doing with my friend Rudy instead. 
but so she's like, why don't we take, she, she saw this like sketch I had of Susie in my uh, sketchbook, and she's like, I want a chola girl, but I don't know, and then she saw Susie, she's like, can you make Susie with like chola hair, and I was like, yeah, so that's the sketch I came up with, and that's actually John Velidez's photo, so I was trying to see, like, you could see where the, where it ends up, <clears throat> and that's the final tattoo that I did on Rudy. I added Chola Bjork to him the other day, too. <laughs> And um, I think we're gonna add, he wants the Alice back one also. Cause he's like, I don't want so many white women on my arm, I need some, yeah, so. Yeah. Um, yeah, so that's my presentation. Um, these are some images actually of, let me see, I'll open these. Of the show at the Vincent Price Museum. Cause I haven't updated this and I had my um, old computer with all them. So this is like a shot of the install. This is the painting of my friend Sandra and Tammy. So I started to hang out with my friend Sandra a lot more. <laughs> Not so much, so Cindy and Elvia I haven't seen in a while, so hence like more paintings of Sandra. Um, this is another drawing of Sandra. She has amazing hair. And this is a drawing of my friend Joe. And so these are the most recent pieces. Um, this is a shot of Joe in my studio after we'd gone out and he just kind of passed out sleeping. But I thought it was there something like very beautiful and um, peaceful about him in this state and like some sort of like drunken passed out and again like put back our hardcore. It's sort of like an escape or like there's self-medicating but in a very like meditative way. It's like sort of commemorating that. So are there any questions about anything? Are you guys asleep that I bore you guys? <laughs> I have a really horrible, like, pre like, I don't know what it is about the podium and talking and the microphone that makes me just like, uh, is there any questions about anything? Yeah. Uh -huh. um, what were you anticipating when you were planning to, like, go to school for art? For so, both your BA and then your MFA. Okay, so I, I um, in San Francisco, I, I went to, I was from the Mission, I'm from the Mission District, um, but I went to Lowell High School which is kind of like in the sunset area and it's like a private magnet school. So you have to apply to get in and it's hard to get in. And it's like a lot of, it's supposedly like the top rated, one of the top 10 in like the country or something. So it was very difficult for me to be there because I think it was 70% Asian. Um, a lot of recent, like or recent immigrants, like Chinese students were there and they were very book smart. I guess they knew how to like read a book and take tests. So it was like really difficult for me to be there from the mission because I look kind of like, I was like a, a girl from the mission. So I was sort of stereotyped as being like, and it was a horrible experience for me. Like the counselors would tell my mom that I had too many boyfriends and that's why my grades were dropping. And I had no boy, I was like a big nerd. I just looked like a girl from the mission. I was from the mission, I looked like it. So um, I remember thinking like, I don't wanna go to school anymore, fuck this, I hate school. Like this is just an awful place. Like I don't, I don't wanna be here. I had, I guess like, even like my biology teacher would use me as an example of like, well, let's say she's here gets pregnant or gets AIDS, what is she gonna do? And I just feel like, really, you know, like it was just how it was. Like I was like the only, one of the only Latino kids in the whole school. There was like, I think it was like 3% and it was only because there were like Filipino kids that went there, I don't know. But um, yeah, so I did not think I was gonna get into school at all. And um, I had really bad grades. I started out with like, I think like A's and B's and every year my GPA went down one full point. And um, it was really difficult. Like I was like, just really, I uh, hated that school so much. Um, I, that was a school also that Margaret Cho got kicked out of. Cause yeah. it caught her, you know, so. Um, yeah, I wanted to transfer. I tried transferring my parents wouldn't let me. They're like, you get a good education here. And I was like, look at my grades. I'm not, I hate it here. But they wouldn't let me transfer. Um, so my mom was like, you should just apply to go to college. And I was like, I'm not gonna get in. I have like horrible grades or whatever. But I took my SAT scores and I had like really high SAT scores. Probably like still a little, I don't know. But anyways, like my SAT scores were super high. So then when I applied to um, UCLA, I applied to the art school because I always take, took like art classes and whatever. And they saw like my portfolio and I just met the minimum requirement. Like it was before, the, it was during the, I don't think the last, the last few years of affirmative action. So I just met it, thank you Affirmative Action for allowing me to go to UCLA, <laughs> and I graduated with honors. So 
Yeah, it was like a really great thing, and that's why I, I don't think I would have gotten into UCLA had I not applied to the art school. Because the art school was the one that was like, saw my portfolio and was like, okay, we accept her to art school. Whereas if it was just like a general ed and I didn't know, like, and declared, I probably wouldn't have gotten it. So um, I went there, it was like, I was talking to Mani about this, how like, it's sort of like culture shock, because she's from Hunters Point and then I was from the Mission during that time, and it was like, we're coming here, and we're like, what the hell is going on around here? This is like Club Med or something. Like, <laughs> what? This is so weird. And everybody's like carefree, walking around, like not a care in the world. And I was like, what? I remember writing like all these like really emo things in my journal, like, oh, how do they not know about the struggle? And like just being really like, really just into it, like how amazingly like culture shock I was going through. Like, what the hell? What am I doing here? Um, I think the first times I did work at the new genres class, there were these really weird videos of me walking around campus going, where am I, where am I, or something. I wish I could find them, they're like, they're horrible. And then, um, yeah, and then, but I hung out with all these other kids who were like in the same boat, they all got in, because like barely at the end of, you know, their GPA, but they're super well-rounded kids, and we all went to like punk shows, and take fly on the car and go to Cafe Blue or something, and it was great, and, yeah, and it was awesome. It was like the best four years of my life coming here. It's like Club Med, we go swimming, we go to the see the bands that are playing in the quad or whatever. Like, and it was just great. It was awesome. Um, and I worked at, I got a work study job at, at Self Help Graphics while I was here. So I took the bus because I'm from San Francisco, so I didn't have a license. <laughs> so I took the bus like three hours from West Westwood to self graphics when I was on gauge, like three different buses to get there. And I had to leave at like 6 a.m. to get there by 10. <laughs> and then I get home, like, I don't know, I get out at four, come back, I don't know, three hours later. But yeah, it was great. Um, it was a perfect like balance to work out there and then come back here. And then I did projects when I was out there and then showed them to the class, like my class out here. Yeah, it was, it was fun. Um, so I started working at East at um, Self Graphics when I graduated, and out there it was like, I was like, oh yeah, this is reminds me of the mission. This is totally the mission at Self Help. This is like Galleria. This is like Mission Cultural Center, you know, only in East LA. And it was the same like printing studio, the same aesthetics, the same artists that were doing work at both spots. And so I was like, okay, maybe I can do this. Maybe I'll be like a, a what is an office manager. And then my hobby is I'll show at Day of the Dead shows once a year or something. <laughs> like, that's what I thought I was gonna do. Like, yeah, I could do that. And I'll be perfectly happy. And, um, but I was like a really bad office manager. Felicia can tell you how bad I was. Like, I was horrible. <laughs> like, yeah, I didn't even know how to answer the phone and be like, what do you want? Like, hello. <laughs> you know, like people would call and ask, like, um, I don't know. <laughs> Weirdo, like, you know? So yeah, um, I, I went, I got into this residency when I was at, um, still at office manager at Self Help, um, and I came back, and then they laid me off, because <laughs> I was like such a horrible <laughs> office person. So I was on unemployment, and I was like, what do I do? And I was like, maybe I should just go to art school again. So I went to graduate school. And the only place I got into was CalArts. So I went there, I don't know why, I was just like, oh yeah, I'll go to CalArts. I was only, you know, I applied to like UC Irvine, I applied to UC, I applied to like, yeah, um, UCLA again, and then I went to CalArts, and then at CalArts, it was just, private art school is just a horrible place, don't ever go. <laughs> yeah, it's just kind of like, if you want to, if you want to go to art school at a, like, CalArts or something, just know all you're going to learn is how the most arrogant white boys in the class talk about your work, and that's it. That's basically what's going to inform your work. That's what happens. You sit there in a critique for like 12 hours, and you have all these kids from the Midwest critiquing your work. And that's all it is. So when you get out, you're like, okay, now I know how like white boys from the Midwest feel about my work, you know. And that's basically it. And the professors are just like, well, you yeah, know, yeah. They don't. They just kind of like let the class do whatever, talk about whatever. So um, I'm just really glad I'm out of that. And uh, yeah, and this is recorded. This is being recorded. <laughs> right. So. Um, yeah, when I got out, I was like, in, I was totally in this, like, they kind of brainwash you to think, like, oh, you have to make it in the art world, you're gonna, like, you know, you're gonna make work about, you know, like, Marxist critique, and you're gonna do all this amazing things, and you have to show here, and you gotta, you know, it's very calculating what they teach you, and it kind of gets you in this, like, weird, um, that in whole insular, really closed off world that doesn't exist in reality. And, um, 
yeah, and it was just kind of like paralyzing for a while to try to create work after after you have all these like weird, really fucked up racist things that people say about your work that you just heard about at CalArts, and you're like, oh my gosh, maybe I shouldn't do work with my friends and them because I'm creating these binaries and it's just like ridiculous. So um, yeah, first I started tattooing, I kind of like that all. Well, I think after I like, decided to do that, the that stuff just sort of fell away and and this like, okay, well, you just do what you do. And the circle of friends that I had, was like forced to hang out with before, I wasn't, I didn't have to work in that, that place either, like that whole insular kind of art assistant thing either. So um, yeah, I just kind of harkened back to what I was, what inspired me about art in the first place. So. Yeah, any other questions? Yeah. <laughs> I have a lot of questions. <laughs> yeah. um, but to, to push a, l a little more on what you were just saying, you, you have a lot of antipathy towards institutional, art, art institutions. Right. Um, and you said in a, a few times in different ways, um, you talked about the insularity of the art world and mm -hmm. how you're glad to be out of the art world. And so it seems well, like not really, but yeah, yeah. Well, so you're, mm -hmm. you're glad to be out of a certain kind of yeah, insular it's a mindset. Yeah, it's just bubble. A, yeah, maybe it's more like a, like a yeah, the, just the, the different mindset, you know? Yeah. Well, I'm curious, like, because you're talking about how CalArts trains you to think in a very mercenary and calculating way about mm -hmm. your art and to think about the artist as um, a, a kind of mm, producer of commodities. But well, I'm, that's the thing. Like, they're so they're so calculating that they're like, no, you shouldn't think about it in terms of how to sell it at all. Like, you have to think about ways. Because I had um, Michael Asher's class, mm -hmm. and he's all about creating artwork that does not that can exist outside of the market. Like, his I think one of his shows was where he just removed the wall that exposed the dealer, and that was it. And so the whole exhibit was just looking at the dealer. Like, this is what this gallery is. It's that dealer sitting right there. Um, so it was very calculating that you didn't participate in the market, and that's why you have a lot of conceptual artists that are, like, born out of there. And it's really great, like, because it does. It's, like, taking, like, a lot of Marxist or, or critiques or or the similar things are like that started the Chicano movement also like it's, it's sort of like very similar and there hasn't been this coalescence of the way it's a way to talk about the way how the two sort of fundamentally have the same values mm -hmm. um which I find disappointing but the way that it was I think what was frustrating for me was that the the verbosity of the particular students that sort of like had reign and the, the lack of diversity that existed in higher education sort of creates this like really problematic experience for a lot of people um and because there wasn't that there wasn't that dialogue I, I couldn't have a dialogue with somebody about that the way that Chicano art the way that Chicano movement sort of like upheld a lot of these like Marxist critiques or what, the, what they were trying to do with the UFW or whatever like there was no one to talk about that stuff with um so it's just very alienating to me and then to the way it was critiqued my work was critiqued was like well yeah they're drawings and paintings so it's like you are just participating in that and and then there was like this just, yeah, so I don't know, like, I guess in that, in that way, um, that's what I found frustrating. And the, and the hierarchicalness of it, too. Like, you have, like, this professor advisor, and you have this very, like, tiered thing, like, PhD, a master's, like, and, and really, like, I think I learned way more in an undergrad than I did at CalArts. And the, the only thing that CalArts kind of taught me was that the theory, French theory, was, like, the same as, like, like the genome theory that I already <laughs> learned, you know? Like, um... And, and that was probably what they had read too. So yeah, that's that's why it was just sort of like frustrating for me it's for to exist in, in that and you have to write a paper and then you have to get your professor's approval. Um, and just it's it's just a hostile place for a lot of people, I think, in terms of because of that structure and and who tends and who participates in it. Yes. Oh yeah, go ahead. Felicia. Bye Oscar, thanks for coming. <laughs> uh, I was wondering if you've shared some of your work like at those clubs, you know, like, like projections oh, yeah, yeah. or things like that of places, um, because a lot of times it's in the gallery and then now you're at home like connecting with the collaborators that are your tattoo artists and it's right. still like this gallery but it's their, their skin is their gallery or like, you know, it's different. Um, and that whole kind of high art, low art kind of connects all together in the tattoo area, but mm -hmm. a lot of the locations for a lot of Chicano artists is always like, like 
more other than Day of the Dead, it's like, <laughs> let's get to that exhibit. Though we're trying to get ahead, move up, you know, and hopefully mm -hmm. those masters or MFAs are going to help us, especially within high art world like CalArts or Otis or whatever, are going to help us to get connected or seen or something to those higher right. ups and open doors to certain galleries along Wilshire or wherever. Uh -huh. So my, I guess, again, my question is like, if you, you're definitely going back um, and doing that a lot in a lot of your community is like, do the HP like now students or those people ever see it like more performance or projection? Oh, right. Okay. Or well, clubs back in Chinatown. Maybe? Yeah. Like, I, would, I did a lot of those like club night shows where it's like, oh yeah, come for one night and show your, show your stuff. And, and it's such a waste of time. It was like, I would go and I'd like install these big, my friend Dorian, he'd have like, these big like cork boards and they were on easels. I think, I don't know who made them, but like, it, so he, he put these in the, at the Grand Star and they were just like big easels. And so I would like pin drawings on them and then watch people like have wine glasses precariously swishing around in front of them. And then it was super dark too, so you can even see the work. And then it was just like, we we're just like decoration for the club night or something. But yeah, the projection sounds in it like an interesting idea. So when I get asked to do the like the club night things, I'm like, no, don't do it. <laughs> it's like, I don't want to do it. Cause it's just like, you have to be like the first one there and then you have to be the last one to leave, you know? And it's just like, I'd be tired. I wouldn't want to like, you know, try to prop this drunk guy off of my, who's like leaning on my drawings or whatever. So I was like, no. Um, but in terms of like the whole like access and, and that's another thing that I, I just get really frustrated at because it is so so elitist the way it works and it is like like gatekeepers that can determine if you are allowed to be here or, you know whatever and um, yeah I do think it's it's really important that we find like alternative venues to create like art happenings and and I think that that's so great and that we should just keep focusing on that um, I think it's really great to critique the way it works but um, I've just gotten to the point where I don't want to try anymore to like, like give me access. Like it's more just like, I'm going to do what I want to do. And it's weird too, because it's like, they're so snobby. It's like the moment you don't want to be part of it, that's when people come for you. And that's true. That's, that's, and that was a critique I had too. And I remember this one art collector, this Chicano art patron at this other talk was kept talking about, well, Chicano art does this and Chicano art does that. And see, we can exist in all these myriad different contexts. And I was like, who the fuck cares? Like, can we just talk about the art, not what Chicano art does, but the actual art that's on the on the wall? Like, and I was like thinking, like, just stop pandering so much. Just like do the work and and create your own thing, and then it's gonna people are gonna come to co-opt it eventually. <laughs> like they're gonna come for it. It's just like the once you stop trying, it's kind of like playing hard to get. You know, like it, <laughs> same thing. Um, I don't know if that answers your question at all. A lot of the work that you share is like, you know, like an HP Young alternative queer mujer or all these alternative like mm -hmm. visions, you know? And so you're like documenting the quote unquote undocumented, but I was just wondering if, you know, how much they see. I know a lot of them are your friends, but mm -hmm. like those young mission girls just like you, you know? And I see, I know like through the Chica Chick and through like the Bart, they get to see them like yeah. through some of those public commissions. So. I guess I'm thinking that, you know, that energy, like that young Shizu mm -hmm. who want to see this work, um, and, and I think is seeing it, you know, mm -hmm. definitely because of your visibility and the different spaces that you're doing, because I think um, it yeah. gives them voice, it gives validity to, to, their, to their lives um, in different ways, you know, at least visually, and, and begin to, I think, do a lot of different things. Oh, thanks, that's really nice. <laughs> I hope so, but I don't know, I don't, yeah. I hope I think that was the impetus of why like I did certain imagery for the Bart or whatever. Um, yeah, I you know I wonder about that too because I think that's one of the reasons why for the Steve Turner show I just did other artists because I was like I don't know who this audience is and I'd rather just mm -hmm. focus on people that I kind of already knew would be familiar with it and it's like the context wasn't so disparaging I guess between the subjects and the gallery I guess. Um, that's why I was like really happy to show at the Vincent Price Museum because it was connected to ELAC and that area and I tattooed down the street from there and there wasn't that weird like otherizing thing that I thought you know in the back of my head that Keller's critique 
um, that was happening. And it was just more like, okay, yeah, I can just like free reign and not have to think about the context so much. Because that is something that I always like consider. It's like context, context. What is it? What does this mean in this space? What is it doing in this space? Um, and yeah, and I have art school to thank for that. <laughs> so in a way, it's, it's Is there any other questions? I know I talked so long. I have, I have catalogs for sale too. I do, I have oh, yeah, yeah. Go ahead. another question sort of related to that and kind of coming back to my observations about your art antipathy. I'm wondering if you can give us like a, a positive vision of the work that art does in the world because you've talked a lot about oh, like right. I know. the Debbie institutional Downer, yeah. conflict. Well, no, that wasn't it a critique on you. Like, mm -hmm. what does it mean? Or you were just saying, like, can't we just talk about the art? Like, what, what does that look like if we're just talking about the art? And what does art look like when it's n not in it? in a hierarchical uh, institutional context. Or, yeah. Um, yeah, it's so hard, it's so difficult because that's such a big part of any art piece is thinking about, you know, why, where, when, mm -hmm. how, um, and then again, like where it ends up, you know? Um, that is something that's like, everybody has to take into consideration and when, with whatever piece, I think with that one particular panel I was on about the whole like Chicano art in this general abstract sense. Um, I was just more interested in the very specifics of of the impetus for each artist, why they did what they did, and whatever context and, and spe specifics. Because I think in general, so much of Chicano art is talked about in terms of Chicano art. Uh, oh yeah, it's the political and this and this. But there's no real criticality or specific, really hard hitting. Um, specific writing or like what you just said about my work and you did that whole analogy between the the writing and stuff like that I mean that's rare that you have a really close reading and it's not merely about um, identity you know but there exists because it's and I think that's the problem because there's so many different levels and things to say and to really analyze and critique um, and not and I'm saying critique or criticality in terms of like a negative way but in a very like um, thorough, thorough way, like talk about all the different things that's going on in this work, and and then I think um, if we do like as as artists ourselves really analyze and critique work that way, um, it'll just be so much easier for for other people to relate to it too um, in a larger larger audience because then you have you talk about the human condition or like um, Harry Gamboa's like the portraits he did of, of the male, he was talking about it in terms of you know, a lot of the people that he photographed are now dead or in jail. And I was like, well, that's like crazy because that's like totally about like the prison industrial complex. Like there's so many things that you can infer in that work that haven't been really like fleshed out or talked about. And we were just talking about Chicano art. And it's like, well, no, that's so amazing. Like let's, talk, let's have a conversation about that, you know? Um, and I think that would have been such a more interesting thing. And then in that, in that conversation, you have the importance of Chicano art already because you're talking about like such specifics that are very concrete and, and very relatable. Um, yeah, so I, I don't I don't know if that's what you're getting at. Oh, it was an open question. Okay. <laughs> Is there any? Yeah. And so how are you feeling now? I mean, in terms of resolving. Um, right. I'm feeling really good. I mean, it's weird when there's a microphone in my face and I'm like on camera because I like I don't know I'm on a podium and. It's strange, so right now I'm feeling kind of nervous, but in general, like, I'm fe I feel really good about, and very satisfied about where things go. I'm kind of nervous about the next, I think I'm doing a um, giant robot show at the Oakland Museum, like um, a group show, so I'm excited about that. Um, and yeah, I can just do whatever I want, I have to worry about context either, because it's in Oakland, and I'm from San Francisco, and I know so many people up there, and it's like the giant robot show, and it's like so accessible. So um, yeah, I'm excited about doing that show. Um, yeah, and then I'm really excited too to be in um, art form, <laughs> like the critique, like wow, I was like cool, this is awesome. And then like Teen Angel magazine coming out too at the same time. So it's like really exciting to be in those two. Yeah. Well, hopefully they can edit me out maybe, but you know. <laughs> I, hope, I still hope I'm in Teen Angel, I don't know. Yeah, I'll see. I'll see when I believe it, and then I'll be really happy. Yeah. Uh, well, I think paradoxically, those might, might be nice words to end on. I hope they didn't edit. Yeah. <laughs>
<laughs> but um, I, please let me thank you again for being here and sharing Thanks your work with me. us. Thanks so much for, for, for staying.